All right, well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight, and for me in particular, it's good to be home. Um, I, uh, Saturday, well, yesterday, I went and I did a funeral for my uncle, and um, um, it had uh, actually been pl- uh, planned, I was going to, uh, my plan was to drive to Yakima uh, yesterday morning, and then do the funeral, and then drive back um, ye- uh, yesterday, or, or Saturday night, I'm sorry, Saturday morning, the plan was to drive to Yakima, do the funeral, come back Saturday night. However, Thursday, as I was getting ready, I got a call from Parrish Plumley, our uh, our uh, home missionary, church planter in Kennewick, Washington, and uh, he asked me if I could cover for him Sunday. Of course, he wanted me to cover all day Sunday, and I said, "Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'm going to be in Yakima, so I can drive over to uh, Kennewick on uh, Saturday night." And I'll cover for you Sunday morning, but I really want to be home uh, Sunday night. And uh, he was uh, on his way out to go to Texas to visit his daughter down there. So anyways, I got to be at, in Brother Plumley's church this morning. He was not there, but one of the things that, um, uh, that uh, I learned uh, when I talked to Brother Plumley on Thursday and in uh, being there today... Uh, you know, one of the reasons that we take on uh, ch- ch- home church plants, the, the whole goal is for those churches to become independent and for those churches to become autonomous and self-supporting, just like we did when, when we came here. And uh, that church now is, in the, is at the point where it can be now self-supporting. And, and so uh, they said that they no longer need the support of, uh, at least the financial support, of uh, Corridor Baptist Church or of their supporting churches, which is a great thing. Man, I was there this morning, and and uh, they are in a new building. Matter of fact, their auditorium is even much larger than our auditorium is, and so they have room to grow, and they are filling it up, and they are filling it up fast, and it's just really exciting what's going on there in Kennewick. What's really exciting is the fact that as a church, we got to see it from the ground up. And, and we've got to do that with a lot of home missions projects here and, uh, and, and some here in the Pacific Northwest. And so that's really exciting. So um, we are dropping their support, but it's not because we're mad at them and it's not for a bad thing. It's because of the fact that uh, Victory Baptist Church in Kennewick is now... Um, is now uh, independent, and in, well, it's always been independent, but you know what I mean. It's self-supporting. No church really is self-supporting because God supports it. But uh, as far as the people in that church given their offerings, then um, that is how the church is going to be supported now. So really exciting, really good, good news. And so it was a thrill to be there uh, with them this morning. All right, well, I know that you had a great morning today also, and we're also looking forward to a good evening service. We always enjoy when Brother Watkins is with us, and this was one of those instances where he was just passing, uh, he was going to be in the area. It was not planned for him to be with us, but it worked out great for us because he was able to be in our banquet on a Friday night and also gets to be with us in the services today. And so I'm just looking forward to, I don't know what friends he's brought tonight, uh, but I, I'm certain he has brought some, and also just to hear the preaching of the word. So Brother Watkins, we, uh, we're always thrilled when you are with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And it's good to have Pastor back. I, I love the fact that he is missed when he is not here. Well, we've had a wonderful time here in Hillsboro. Thank you so much for your gracious hospitality. Thank you to Mark and Lori. That missions apartment is just wonderful. I don't know if what you call it. I don't know if you call it a missions apartment, um, prophet's chamber, palace. But anyway, it's wonderful. It, it really sets the standard high. And thank you so much for your attention to detail. And it's just very well uh, portioned. Thank you, too, to everybody that participated in Friday's dinner. The, the food uh, was uh, incredible. It was fantastic. The decorations were over the top. I had to take a video uh, as well, and it'll be stamped that it was in Hillsboro, Oregon, not really Arabia. Um, but just a great job. Y'all just do such a fantastic job, and I appreciate the opportunity to have had a meal with Pastor and his dear wife, and 
Uh, their hospitality was just great. Appreciate, too, the meal we had today with Brother Andrew and his wife, and uh, their little one was sleeping all the time we were eating. So it was just, it's a, just a, been a great, great time. Thank you, too, for your organization. I, just little things mean so much. Wednesday's message uh, from your pastor reminded me that all things ought to be done decently and in order. When we're in a number of places, sometimes we're in a place, and I'm one of the speakers, maybe not the, not, not, uh, the speaker, but one of the speakers, and, and sometimes we're in a place just passing through, and, and so our practice, our habit, our tradition is that we are in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And I'm just really concerned these days about the declaration of the Word of God and how it has so degenerated into a talk and it's basically a many times a fellow getting up this to the pulpit a a uh, or a podium and the bible being opened and you know this is something the lord laid on my heart and we just go through a text read the text comment read the text comment read the text comment there's no bottom line that calls for a decision there's not organization and the Bible says all things ought to be done decently and in order. And maybe that's a reflection of my age, but I like a message. I like a sermon that's organized because I can remember it better. And maybe that is an age thing. Uh, but I so appreciate the fact every time I've heard your pastor preach, he has had a message from the word of God. It's been soundly biblically based and it has been organized. It's been thought through and there's been a call for a decision. Man, I appreciate that. That is so incredibly refreshing. Your spirit here is marvelous. My dad and stepmom were here in the service this morning, and I mean, almost at the get-go, she commented about how friendly this place was and how it takes some of the apprehension off uh, 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 as you come in and you're greeted by so many people, and thank you so much. Um, they were at a service, uh, a big service where a bunch of churches had had joined together, and they had a play right around the Easter time. And as the invitation time, they asked for unbelievers to stand, um, unbelievers to stand. And my stepmother, she didn't hear it properly, so she stood. And she was one, one of a handful of people that stood. <laughs> and, and so, but afterwards, she wanted to clarify, you know, actually, I am a believer. I just, I didn't understand what the question was. Uh, but she was standing there and but she got, I'll tell you what, they, they were ready to win her to the Lord, and they gave her a gospel presentation, a DVD presentation of the gospel, and all sorts of things. And so when she was here this morning, I was tempted to remind her now, at the invitation time, listen carefully, you know, <laughs> listen carefully. So, and so when I asked if, you know, folks had the testimony that they knew the Lord, well, her hand went up, and then if they didn't have the testimony that they knew the Lord, that there'd never been a time and a place where they put their faith in Christ to raise their hand, and I looked to make sure she didn't raise her hand. So she was, she was listening very carefully, but they felt so at home. Thank you so much for your hospitality, and thank you for your faithfulness here in the Northwest. God is using you, not just here, as you know, but really around the world. Well, this evening, I do have a couple of things with me, and so let me start with this. I I, I'll never forget the very first, very first illusion that I saw. Uh, it, was, it was so much fun. And normally I would have music at this part, as you know, but not tonight. But um, I, I, the first effect that I saw, I was in uh, Long Beach, California. I was about, um, about five years old, and there was something going on in the park, and there was like an illusionist there. It's indelibly imprinted upon my mind, and the illusionist, illusionist did this effect, and you know the one. It's where you, where you take uh, one, two, three, four, five, six Uno game pieces, you know, and you, and, and you take these pieces and you remove one, two, Three Uno game pieces. And the illusionist that was doing this in the black suit and the black derby hat, he waved his hand, snapped his fingers, and amazingly, he had one, two, three, four, five, six Uno game pieces uh, left over. And I was amazed. I thought, wow, I am so amazed. I want to amaze people. But then as I grew and realized that these things could be used as object lessons, I realized that here is something that could talk about the wonderful generosity of God. It could talk about how that, that when we give to God, we don't lose anything. 
In fact, when we give to God, he is always so gracious to give back. And not always, perhaps, if in the same form, like if we give of our tithes and offerings that he somehow gives money and puts it in our account. I'm not talking about that, but he's a generous God. And so I thought, man, I would love to get that effect. So I went into a magic store when I got enough money together, and I went into a magic store that sold magic tricks, and I said, hey, I'm looking for an effect. You know the one. It's where the illusionist takes one, two, three, four, five, six Uno game pieces, and he removes visibly one, two, three of the Uno game pieces, waves his hand, snaps his fingers, and amazingly has one, two, three, four, five, six Uno game pieces left. And the guy said, I know that effect. Let me go back into the back and see if we still have that available. So he went into the back. And he went into the back. He talked to one of the clerks that were back there. He says, I'm looking for an effect. There's a customer at the counter. And he's looking for that effect. You know the one. It's where the illusionist takes one, uh, two, three, four, five, six Uno game pieces. He removes one, visibly removes one, two, three Uno game pieces, waves his hand, snaps his fingers, and still has one, two, three, four, five, six Uno game pieces. Well, the clerk said, oh, we don't sell that anymore. For some reason, they don't manufacture that effect. We don't sell that anymore. Don't even have the directions for it. So the guy came out to the counter. Because at, the, at this stage, I realized this would be a great illustration about the generosity of God. You can't outgive God. But he came to the counter. He said, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. We don't have that effect. You know the one. It's the one where the illusionist takes one two, three, four, five, six Uno game pieces. He removes visibly one, two, three Uno game pieces, waves his hand, snaps his fingers, and still has one, two, three, four, five, six Uno game pieces. It says, we can't sell it to you. We don't manufacture it anymore. That's our story. We're sticking to it. But God is generous. You can't outgive God. Uh, he's such a gracious God, such a giving God. And if we ever doubt that, all we need to do is remember Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, here's something that you may have seen before. And in fact, you may have seen us do this before. I'm going to need some people to help me out in a moment. But it is from the life of a man named Eric Weiss. Uh, usually at this point, I'll say, how many of you have heard of the famous illusionist? How many of you have heard of David Copperfield? Raise your hand if you've heard it. Of course, we've heard it. Or David Blaine. Sure. Uh, David, this seems to be rather popular. Uh, Chris Angel, anybody? Uh, they, okay, mind freaks here. Good. <laughs> Howard Thurston. That's not the guy on Gilligan's Island. Uh, but a world-famous magician, an American magician by the name of Howard Thurston. He was a contemporary of Eric Weiss. How many of you have heard of Eric Weiss? All right. You will remember that Eric Weiss was the actual name of Harry Houdini. All right. Or Tony Curtis, for those of us that are older. Um, <laughs> Tony Curtis. <laughs> what does that mean? Okay. For the younger crowd... <laughs> In a very old film depicting the life of Harry Houdini, there was an actor named Tony Curtis who played the part of Houdini, of Eric Weiss. And, uh, and he was an amazing gentleman. I had the opportunity to meet him, and just an amazing gentleman he has since passed. But anyway, so Eric Weiss. Now, Eric Weiss, we, re we remember the name Harry Houdini. That was his stage name. He borrowed a name from a magician very famous in France by the name of Robert Houdin, and he put an I at the end. And some debate whether it was an homage to that famous magician in France or whether it was simply a ripoff of his name and throwing an I after it. So the debate continues. We don't remember necessarily Howard Thurston or Harry Keller, but we remember Harry Houdini even though those three men were contemporaries at the same time, and they were household names when it came to the world of illusion and entertainment. But Howard Thurston and Harry Keller, 
They wanted to be remembered as they lived. They wanted to have that reputation as they lived. But Houdini wanted to be remembered even after he was gone. And so we still talk about Houdini, but we don't talk much about Keller or Thurston unless you're in the, the uh, circles of, of illusionists. So Eric Weiss as a boy had an opportunity to watch a magic show by a famous magician named George Downs. George Downs was amazing. His, his specialty was sleight of hand, and a signature effect that he had was an effect called the miser's dream. And you've probably seen it. It's where the illusionist takes six, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but he takes, it's where the illusionist comes out on stage with a, a bucket, a metal bucket, and plucks coins from the air, throws them in the, in the otherwise empty bucket, and collects them that way. And, on the, and, and Houdini wanted to see George Downs, his father, who, uh, immig- who brought the family from Budapest, Hungary, to Appleton, Wisconsin. His father wouldn't have anything to do with that, that show. But his mom, Houdini pestered his mom. At the time, Eric Weiss pestered his mom, and she finally acquiesced, and they went to see George Downs. Houdini was about 12 years old at the time, which is the age a lot of guys get involved in this sort of thing. And in the audience that day, George Downs did his signature effect pulling coins out of the air, dropping them in a bucket, which, by the way, also is a marvelous illustration of the great generosity of God. But as a part of his signature routine, George Downs would call a young man up from the audience, about 10 years old. And that day he didn't call on Eric Weiss. He was still in the audience. But he called a 10-year-old boy up and started plucking coins out of various parts of the boy's anatomy, out of his ear, pulled a coin, out of, his, out of his other ear, pulled a coin, out of his elbow, out of his nostrils, a bunch of coins would rain into the bucket. And this was hilarious. The audience was just rolling with laughter. And this is when Harry Houdini heard something that he didn't ever hear before, or if he did, it was very rare. He heard the laughter of his mother beside him. And he was bit, they say, by the magic bug. And he determined at that time that's what he wanted to do. There was another man who was a contemporary, and again, we don't know much of this man uh, these days, but he was an amazing inventor of illusion effects. His name was uh, Bliss, excuse me. His name was Selbit, P.T. Selbit. Now, P.T. Selbit, we don't remember the name, but but everybody who has any reputation of doing illusions always gets asked about P.T. Selbit's effect. Because you talk to anybody, and they will say as if they thought of it themselves, hey, can you saw my wife in half? <laughs> and you are obliged to laugh as if it is the first time you have heard that uh, question. P.T. Selbit developed the effect of sawing a lady in half. But he also developed another effect that I want to do for you tonight, and it was made popular by... Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini did a lot of the normal things that a fellow will do. He did manipulations. He did effects with cards. In fact, one time, he was billed as the king of cards. But we know him him as the king of escapes. And there are all sorts of great gospel illustrations when it comes to escapes. Great gospel illustrations. As you and I have been born in the bondage of sin, born in sin's bondage and nothing we could do in and of ourselves could get ourselves out of it. What we need is a miracle, someone outside of ourselves to set us free. Of course, that is the Lord Jesus Christ through the death, burial, and resurrection. He sets us free from sin's bondage. And the effect that P.T. Selbit developed that Houdini made popular had a long title. Back in those days, the titles were long. It's called the Siberian Prisoner Transport Chain Escape. Today, we just call it the chain escape. It's a lot easier. But for this, I need the help of a couple of people. Would you two young ladies help me out? Would you come help me out? Fantastic. Are you friends or sisters? Cousins, of course. If you'll come stand right up here. And what is your name again? What is it? Samantha. Samantha. And you are? Caitlin. All right. If you'll stand right here, Caitlin and Samantha. Okay, very good. Very good. All right. Have you helped me with this before? No, have you helped me with this before? This is fun. This is called the cloth of mystery. Okay, well, a little bit of coaching would help. Uh, Usually when a man says cloth of mystery, it gets this response of ooh. (laughs) Usually it does, but not in the Northwest. (laughs) 
nor in Canada. They write it down on a little card and hold it up. Ooh. Okay, if you would hold that corner for me, please, and hold this corner with the other hand. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There we go. Perfect, perfect. Okay, and then if you'll hold that corner there and that corner there. Okay, I'm going to put my hands in there. Go ahead and close the cloth and then open it. And I take my hands out. We put my hands in, close the cloth, open it, take my hands out. That's our rehearsal. Woo! <laughs> really tough, isn't it? If you ladies could stand right there for a moment, have a little bit more housekeeping to do. And with that, I need a young man to help me out that's 12 or older. 13 or older, 13, 12, 10 or under. No, I, um, I need a gentleman to help me out. Is there a gentleman that would be willing to help me out? A guy that would be willing to help me out? Going once, going twice. Oh, Alec, come and help me out. Wonderful. That'll be great. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being so enthusiastic. Involuntold. Involuntold. All right. I have a bag. Would you please hold that bag? Thank you. What? <laughs> Is there anybody else that'd be willing to? No. Sir, if you reach into the bag and you're going to find some contents in there, pull out the first thing that comes out of the bag there. Ah, yes, a lock with a bag. And it is attached to the key. That way I never lose the bag. That's good. We'll uh, play with that in a moment. Go ahead and reach in and pull out the other item that's in there. Yes, and I will take the bag. It has now outlived its usefulness. Very good. All right, give that a good tug. Step here so that people could see you. It is a chain, and it is a chain that has two rings welded onto it. And the rings are welded, the gaps are welded, so that the rings can't come off of the chain, all right? And there are no weak links or fake links, or at least that you know of or can find. Nope. <laughs> all right, very good. And you've given it a good tug there. All right, good. And, sir, if you would, go ahead and um, I'll take this out off of here maybe okay or maybe not okay sir if you would go ahead and unlock that lock all right and it unlocks now take the key out and then lock the lock and then check to make sure that the key oh yeah that it's not a fake lock okay good 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 and then once again put the key in and unlock it very good take the key out and i'm going to put the key Right over here. Sir, give that a good tug. Give that a good tug. Make sure that, yeah, good. Oh, yeah, that's good. All right. And then what I'm going to have you do is reach over my wrist. Reach over my wrist with that hand. Grab that chain. Pull it through there. And put it through the ring that's there in the bottom there. Pull it through, put it through the ring. And give that a good tug. Nice, good tug. All right. Good. Is it, that feels nice and tight. Can it go any further? Can it go any further? I think that's it. Okay. Good, and I do. I feel the blood now uh, being cut off to the, to the hands. All right, if you would lock the chain to the ring, lock the ring to the chain, that would be great, putting the lock through both the chain and the ring, and it's on there. Okay, and it's locked nicely. Once again, give that a good tug on the end of the chain. All right, give Alec a hand for helping me out. Thank you, sir. You may have a seat. Okay. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, I know how this is done. I watched that masked guy on Fox as he revealed the secret. See, what Alec did is he locked the chains around, around uh, Watkins' muscular forearms. And while we're not looking, Watkins is going to relax his muscular forearms and the chain is going to slide off. And a couple of observations. Number one, Watkins does not have muscular forearms. <laughs> Observation number two is that chain is around my wrists and my hands cannot slide out of it. A minor illustration of a major Bible truth. When you and I got saved, we were set free from sin's bondage. And there was an enemy, too, that was dragging people to the grave through the millennia. And that, of course, was that enemy called death. And the only way to be freed from that enemy and freed from the tomb is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. A minor illustration of a major Bible truth. Ladies, if you'll go ahead and stand there at the front there of the platform. Houdini oftentimes would take 45 minutes. He would make an audience wait 45 minutes until they saw that he was out of whatever restraints he was placed in. Many times he'd be off to the side of the stage reading a newspaper after only five minutes of the ordeal. We are not in a day and age where an audience will wait for 45 minutes. Instead, they'll stand there for days watching a man in a block of ice named David Blaine. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Talk about a show that drags. Okay, so 
we're going to try to get out of these in, in maybe maybe three minutes or so. I think that's about what our attention span is these days. Go ahead and open that up. Go ahead and close it. That'd be great. Lift it up a little bit. I don't want people to see how any of this is being done. Okay. So with that, wait a second. All right. So with that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to get out in three minutes. Now, three minutes time is not a very long time, but I'm going to try to get out in three minutes time. Give that a tug. Make sure it's nice and tight. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Very good. Once again, we'll close that up. Houdini sometimes would take up to, up to, like I said, 45 minutes, a little bit higher, a little bit higher right there to the, okay, <laughs> up to 45 minutes. But me tonight, I'm going to see if I can get out in a very quick amount of time, very short amount of time, so that, so that we can go ahead and move forward and hopefully, hopefully get a sermon preached tonight. Excuse me a second. Okay, get a sermon <laughs> preached tonight. All right, so once again, I just take the chains, I place them right into here. And on the count of three, one, two, three, and they're out. Would you reach in there and pull that out of there for me, Samantha? And is it still locked? Yes. It is still locked. Thank you so much, ladies. Give them a hand for helping me out. I could not have done that without you. Did a great job, ladies. All right. Well, that's fun. Maybe one of these days we'll go through the risk of actually not only being chained, but also placed into a wooden crate and thrown, being thrown into a baptistry. <laughs> We're not going to do that. Although that would be like really cool because Baptist churches have baptistries. That would be interesting. Anyway. All right. I do have a friend of mine with me and uh, I'll put this other cuff link on later. Instead, I will put this cuff link on with the sleeve that I need to have free. But that's okay. All right, so I do have a friend of mine with me. You may have seen him before as well. But the message is timeless. This is Howard, Howard the dog. Hello, Howard. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. All right, and you uh, are obviously, obviously a dog. How did you know that? Well... You look like a dog. What do you mean I look like a dog? I mean, you look like a dog. You have the characteristics of a dog, the features of a dog. Yeah, like what? You have the floppy ears. Yeah, I got that, the floppy ears, okay. You have the nose of a dog. Yes, I do, I have that. Okay, you have the stomach there. Hey, hey, hey. Well, it's true. You have the stomach. Well, you have the stomach too. And hey, 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 chill there. Um, you also have dog breath. I do. Yes, you have dog breath. And you have the appetite of a dog. For example, what do you like to eat? I love to eat garbage. Yes, garbage. I love garbage. Yeah, it's delicious. Mm -hmm. And uh, garbage, any particular type of garbage? Oh, rotting, putrid garbage. Putrid garbage. Yeah, disgustingly delicious. Mm -hmm. And you, what else do you like to eat? Oh, the second thing is I love to eat cats. Mm, cats. I love cats, I see. You know what they taste like? I'm going to say chicken. No, oh, it tastes like garbage, rotting, putrid garbage. All right. That's right. So you eat cats, all right? Oh, but you also have some traits of dog. Like, dogs love to be scratched here. Oh, I like that. You like that? A little lower. You like that? Okay. Okay. So, but you remind me, also, you probably have dog issues. I do have dog issues, yeah. Okay, like, um, like, what do you have, like, a problem with? What do you struggle with? Well, I struggle with fleas. Fleas? Fleas. You struggle with fleas. They're just tiny little creatures. Yeah, but they're annoying. Really? They like to, they like to chew away at my skin. They chew away at your skin? Yeah. Uh -huh. So they, they nibble at you and, and, and bite away? That's what they do. What do you do when you have a flea? Oh, well, that's easy. Okay. I chew them up and swallow them. I see. They taste like cats. I see. So, <laughs> could you demonstrate? I sure could. Okay. You have a flea right there on my foot. Okay. On this foot, there's a flea. There's a flea on my leg. Okay. And uh, what, are, what is he doing? He's chewing on my leg. Okay. And what are you going to do? First, I'm going to say, look out, flea. Here I come. That's very kind. I know. That's merciful. I know. Uh -huh. I do that so he can flee. Flea. Okay, go ahead. Here I come, Flea. Ah! Oh, wow. Wow. You just chewed that up. 
Yep, just like cats. I see. <laughs> well, you remind me of Christians. You guys eat cats? No, no, I uh, know. Uh, you guys eat fleas? No, no. You remind me of Christians because Christians have a pesky thing that would sap the life out of our Christian experience, out of our spiritual experience. And it's a thing called sin. Oh, sin. I know. Sin, the things we do that, that, uh, uh, that separate us from God as far as our fellowship is concerned. Not our relationship, but as far as our fellowship is concerned. And so we need to get victory over those one by one like you do with the fleas. One by one. That's right. Have you ever had a flea dip? Is that like guacamole? No, 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 no. I mean, flea dip. It's like it's where you get washed from head to toe and it gets rid of the fleas. No, I haven't had that. Yeah. Well, see, when we get saved, we are washed and cleansed from sin. But we have these easily besetting things that we're prone to that we need to get victory over. And we can one by one. And the Lord gives us resurrection power to do that. Have you ever worn a flea collar? Well, why would I want to do that? Because it keeps away the fleas. How come you call them? No, you don't call them. It's not a flea collar. Like here, flea, it's a, something that goes around your neck and it keeps the, it repels the fleas. It repels them? Yes, repels them. But you take care of them one by one. All right. Chewing them up. Yeah. Swallowing them. Okay, good. All right. They're delicious. All right. Well, good. Well, I'm going to put you. Wait, wait. I have, I have another flea. You do not. I do. I have another one. Another one. Same place. Okay. Right there? There he is. Look out, flea, here I come. No. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yes. He said no. I know. I know. A talking flea. I know. Do you get those a lot? Not since the last time I did this routine. I know. <laughs> Look out, flea, here I come. No, no, what do you think? Wow. I'm going to eat him anyway. Okay. All right. I'm going to eat you anyway, Flea. <laughs> yeah. Ah! <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, it's a long way down. I know. It's a long way down. It's a long way down. As a Christian, just like, just like old Howard as a dog, has the characteristics of a dog, so, 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 so we also are to have characteristics that adorn our lives that reveal the fact that we are people of God. All right. So we're going to put you away, okay? All right. All right. Into the, into the pulpit you go. And that's Howard the dog. Howard, my friend. All right. Well, that's fun. You are so gracious and so kind. Not long ago, I, I uh, had purchased a headset to go with my phone because my phone no longer has an, a, a jack to plug into for headphones. E even though there's a YouTube video that suggests you can actually drill into it and create one. It's totally fraudulent. You'll have to get a new iPhone. But... Uh, so. I was, uh, so I need, so I bought this headset. It was a Bluetooth, Bluetooth technology. I'm going to be in Tiger next week. I want to give you the address. <laughs> Tell you what nights were there. I could sure use that. Um, but anyway, if you've ever had to purchase a, a headset and pair it with your phone, you know the whole process. First of all, you have to read the directions. That's not a very manly thing. But anyway, so you read the directions, and in the directions it suggests, number one, that you turn on the device. The, ter the vi device is turned on. You go to your settings in your phone. You go and look for the device to be listed there. You press on the device because when you turn on the device, your device is discoverable to your phone. And so you press on the device and the listings, and suddenly those two things are paired. Sometimes I could use my phone as a hotspot, as a, as a hotspot, a Wi-Fi hotspot. And to do that, I go to the settings, I turn it on to Wi-Fi hotspot. It is now discoverable. In fact, my phone will say that, I, that it is now discoverable as Rob Watkins iPhone. Well, I submit to you that God has a desire to be discoverable. That God wants to make himself discoverable to the world that is around us. And our God is amazing at this. I remember years ago when my children, two oldest children were young, they were, they were like uh, three and five, three and five, and we were at my in-law's house, and they were playing hide-and-seek. 
And so my children counted. I had to help them count because they were three and seven, uh, three and five, three and five. And so they're three and five, they're counting. And so I'm helping them count. Grandpa goes and hides. And I'm going to tell you, he's not a very good hider. Because he went into the living room, he hid behind a big old recliner chair. But the bottom half of Grandpa was sticking out from behind the chair. The only part that was hidden was that top part of him. Well, my children finished counting. They went running through the house looking for Grandpa, and he was easily found. And I suspected that he had hidden in such a way that he could be found. And my suspicions were verified. Because when they found him, again, easy to be found, that's when the joy began, the delight began, the tickling began, the laughter began, and the memories were made. And I submit to you that God has also hidden himself in an obvious way so as to be found. And when you find him, that's when the joy begins. That's when the delight begins. That's when the memories are formed. How is it that God has made himself discoverable? When we look in the Word of God, we find uh, that there are some ways that God has made himself discoverable. By way of introduction, in Doctrine 1, we always talk about the two ways that God has made himself discoverable. The one way God has made himself discoverable is through what we call general revelation. General revelation. And anyone that's, that's been through any doctrine class can tell you what general revelation is. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, also in Psalm 19, we are told that through creation, man can know that God exists. God has, has, uh, through creation, revealed two things. If you never read a Bible, if you never heard a preacher, if you never went to a church, there are two things that you can learn simply by looking at nature with its intricacies, with its design. Number one, you can learn that God is, that God exists. And number two, you can learn that God is powerful. Now, you may not know God's name through creation. You may not know the great work he's gone through for our salvation through what he has made. But through general revelation, you can know that God is and that he is powerful. There's a second type of revelation, and that is what is called a specific revelation. You have general revelation. You have special revelations. Through special revelation, the message becomes more clear. And again, I submit to you that God wants to be found. He is not hiding himself from man. In the book of Proverbs, there's discussion there about wisdom, great teaching about wisdom. And one of the things we find out is that wisdom is readily available and readily found. That wisdom calls out to those who would listen and calls out in the common areas that are trafficked through and calls out so that it can be discovered. But wisdom becomes hard to find when we reject it, when we do not listen to her calls, when we turn our ear away, and as that becomes a habit of life. God is just like that wisdom personified. He makes himself known in an abundant way. If somebody walks out and says, well, where is God? We have a question. Show me where he isn't because he is. He is all around. You can see him all around us. See evidence of him all around us. And then there's special revelation. Through special revelation, as you will know, as you will remember, the special revelation that God gives us is one through the word written, the word of God. And this morning in Sunday school, we talked about the unique nature of the word of God. It can be trusted. It can it can be depended upon. And so he tells us what he is like through the special revelation of the word of God, the word written. In there, we learn words about salvation. We learn about God's great plan of redemption. We learn that we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold or from our vain conversation received by tradition from our fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So we have special revelation. In addition to general revelation through nature, there's general revelation also through our conscience, through our conscience. We, every man, every human being has a sense of what is right and what is wrong. We don't always agree about what things are right, what things are wrong, but there's always... In everybody, the sense there are some things that are right, some things that are wrong. Who is it to put that there but our designer? God put that there. In fact, this this sense that is within us resonates with what we see around us. So that through God's general revelation outside of us and God's general revelation inside of us, we can know that God exists and that he's the one that put in us this, this conscience, if you will, even though it's warped by the fall, this conscience. In fact, This revelation generally is so abundant that the psalmist says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God because he denies what he sees and he denies what he senses when he says there is no God. Through special revelation, through the word of God, we learn what our God is like. We learn that he is just. We learn that he is holy. But we also learn that he is loving. 
And we also learn that he is generous. And so we have the written word. We also have the word incarnate, special revelation where God shows us what he is like through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the pages of Scripture, if we want to know what God is like, all we need to do is study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have general revelation through nature, through our conscience. We have special revelation, the word written and the word incarnate, the word in flesh. But there's another type of revelation that the, that the doctrine classes don't teach us about. There's another way that God has made himself discoverable that gets missed in Theology 101. And it's very practical. And it points us to a responsibility that falls on our shoulders. Let me take you to a familiar text in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Right in the, right in the text that deals with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, chapter 5. Right after the Beatitudes, right after those, those kingdom attitudes, right after those things that are to adorn the life of the follower of Christ, the believer uh, of God, Right after that, we find these very familiar verses beginning in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. And the Bible says this, you'll remember it, ye are the salt of the earth. Specific article, the, you are the salt of the earth. Not a salt, not one of the things that salts out of many, you, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, children of the king, you are the salt of of the earth. And the Bible continues. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. The characteristic that makes salt effective it's, is its distinctiveness. When it loses that distinctiveness and begins to, to blend in with the food that it is supposed to preserve or season, it has lost its effectiveness. <clears throat> when it becomes bland, it loses its effectiveness. And it's not good for anything except for pavement. And I, we live in a day and age, and you know this, where it seems like in Christendom in America, there is this desire not to be distinct. There is this desire not to have a flavor, but to blend in with the world and hence become bland, why would the dead, decaying, corrupt world want more of what it already has? It needs something that is different. It needs someone who is different. That one that's different is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be effective for him as we are distinct from the world around us. And again, as, as uh, Pastor Wilder mentioned on Friday night, not that we would be weird for the sake of being weird, but there is to be a difference. We are separated unto God and separated out from the world. And this is going to show up in our attitudes. It's going to show up in our actions. It's going to show up in the things that attract us. It's going to show up in the things that repel us. We're to be distinct. And I think sometimes when Christianity in America is marginalized, I think sometimes it is simply the response of a culture a culture into which the salt has been tossed into the street and is trodden under the foot of men because it's lost its distinctiveness. Sometimes when we get marginalized, we call it persecution. When the fact is we're getting exactly what we deserve because they do not see a difference in us, a true difference. And so we are the salt of the earth. But in addition to that, the Bible says we're the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Oftentimes, as Jesus gives illustrations, we can't help but believe that there was something nearby that became the source of the object lesson. Later on in this text, he talks about worry and anxiety. And he says to those in the audience, uh, he says, behold, the lilies of the field. Were there lilies nearby? No doubt there were. Were they in their full bloom? No doubt they were. And he talks about how they don't toil or spin. They're not in the process of making fibers to, to make clothing. They're not wringing their little, their, their little hands as flowers, wondering, oh, how, what are we going to wear? And yet they, are, they are, have more splendor than, than Solomon. And so he uses that. And so here he says, you are a, a, 
the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill. Would there not have been a city nearby? Of course, Jerusalem was on a hill. Would there not be a city nearby where the walls gleam underneath the sunlight's beams? Would there not be a city that was very obvious? And what about at night after the sun goes down? Would not the amber glow of the collective torches and lanterns and lamps, would they not cast, cast their amber glow against the canopy of the sky so that even at night you could see the city that is on a hill? And I wonder if that doesn't refer to us as a local church, that we are a city on a hill when we gather, to, gather together. It's a collection of the lights. And all that we would be distinct in a community, that people would know that, that, the, that, that the church is different, that the church has something to offer, that at times the church is dangerous. Oh, if you go there, be careful, be careful. Your life might be changed. Be careful if you go there. You know, they, they talk about a life-transforming gospel. It may become dangerous to go there, dangerous to your status quo, dangerous to business as usual. Boy, be careful there. Those people, they fear God. They revere God. They obey God. Boy, if you go there, be careful. Your life might be transformed. It's a dangerous place. Boy, that was the nature of the church in the book of Acts. It was a dangerous place as the fear of God fell upon all men, as they revered God and sought to obey him. And so we want to be a city on a hill. But then the Bible gets very specific. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Notice what he says next. Verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And boy, that makes sense. We don't say, hey, Junior, go ahead and light that candle there. And while you're at it, go get me a bowl. We're going to put that candle under a bowl. Now, a bushel would have been most likely a clay uh, bowl of some sort that would hold a measure of grain. And people don't light a candle and then put a bowl over it. We don't do that. It, for one thing, it snuffs out the candle. But it also obscures the light. And many times this is exactly what we do. Oh, we're the light of the world. But sometimes that light gets obscured because of disillusionment or because of frustration or because of fatigue or because of disrespect. Maybe we're not treated the way we ought to be by a clerk, and suddenly the light is obscured by our frustration. And maybe we don't get served as quickly as we think we should by the server at the restaurant, and suddenly the light becomes obscured because we're tired and hungry. We are hangry. And so the light gets obscured. He says, men don't light a candle to put it under a bushel. And I know sometimes the temptation is to really insulate our lives, to deal only with believers <coughs> in all facets of life, to deal only with believers. You know, hey, I have a Christian barber. Hey, I found a Christian grocer. Hey, I have a Christian, ins a Christian insurance salesman. Hey, I found a Christian used car salesman. Okay, I have a Christian insurance guy. <laughs> you know, uh, I have a Christian attorney, and we do that. I remember when I was pastoring in Moreno Valley, a couple came to me one day, all excited. The house next to them was sold, and they met the family that bought it. And they came and said, oh, man, pastor, this is great. The family that's moving in next door to us, we found out that they are Christians. They are Christians that bought the house. They are Christians that are going to be our neighbors. And I said, oh, that's too bad. They said, no, they're Christians. I said, no, that's, that's too bad. It would have been great if the Lord would have trusted you enough to move lost people in next door to observe your Christian testimony. Pastor, you're always so negative. <laughs> Such a downer. But the light is not to be obscured. It's there to shine. And we're not supposed to go out in a compound somewhere and put walls up around us and isolate ourselves from the world. Because God has a desire not only to reveal himself through general revelation and not only through special revelation, but catch this. God has a desire to reveal himself to people through relational revelation. Amen. That's good. Through you and through me. Notice what verse 16 says. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. There are three aspects of that verse we just want to touch on tonight. Three aspects of that verse that we might be obedient to God and let our light shine. Because there's a question. If we do not let our light shine, how else will people see what God is like? 
how else will they see what God is like? And because God knows that they may miss it in nature because of the hardness of their hearts. And they may never open a Bible and see that that special revelation up to this point in their lives. But they come in contact with you and me as we buy our groceries, as we talk to the gas station guy that pumps the gas, as we cross paths with our neighbors or a fellow student or a colleague or somebody on a sports team. God knows that we come in contact with all kinds of people and he wants to make himself discoverable through us to those people. And so he brings us within range so that they could be paired with him. So three things in this verse about how that works. First of all, there's the place. The Bible says ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men. The place is before men. The place is is before men. The place before men. Would you say that with me? The place before men. Again, the place before men. One last time. The place before men. Where is it that we let this light shine? It is before men. It is that people may see what our God is like. It is that people may see his characteristics coming through our lives. Again, that's why we don't go off into a compound somewhere and isolate ourselves because God's desire is that he would be discoverable through your life and through mine, through your attitude and through mine, through your actions and through mine. I remember a few years ago we were running late to church. We're running late to church, and when we're running late to church, we always hit every traffic light. Now, in our neighborhood, that means two traffic lights, two traffic lights. And we hit them. They're red. We always hit them when they're red, uh, when we're running late. If we're running early, if we're going early and need to kill a few moments, oh, no, it's green and going all the way through. All right. But when we're running late, we get stopped by the traffic lights. And I and I'm sitting there looking around uh, because we're stuck at a traffic light. I'm looking around and I'm finding there are other people there also who are late to their churches because they're wearing the church attire. Not typically the thing you'd wear grocery shopping, their coats and ties and things like that. And we all have on our default faces. These are the faces that we go to by default. We do not have them intentionally. It's just when we relax, it's the face we have. And it's generally something that looks like It does not reflect a heart that is full of joy unspeakable and glory. It may even have a twinge of anger in it. And that's our default face. It does not say, I love the Lord. Wouldn't that be something? I love the Lord. I am filled with joy. (laughs) I do not understand why people do not ask a reason of the hope that is in me with meekness and fear. I don't understand. I was in a supermarket in our town, and I had my default face on. I have to work not to wear the default face. I have to work on that. But it's a work that's necessary if I'm going to make God discoverable to others. And so I I have to work on this, but I was wearing my default face, and a 19-year-old cashier called me on it. He called me on it. He actually said this out loud in the hearing of other people in a public place. He said, Cheer up, sir. Things could be worse. I said, I will have you know I am a happy person. And then afterwards, here's a track, because I know you want what I have. But we do that, don't we? The default face. But God's desire is that he would make himself discoverable. He is glorified when people know that our joy is in him. He is honored when people know that he is our portion. He is pleased when people know that he is more than enough in our lives. And so the place is before men. This is why it's important to have interactions. Now, yes, we must be cautious. We must be careful because the Bible does have some safeguards about who to get close to. We certainly understand that. But the fact is God wants to make himself discoverable to the people with whom we come in contact The place is before men. And the process is spelled out here as well. The Bible continues that they may see your good works. The process is good works. The process, 
good works. Would you say that with me? The process, good works. Again, the process, good works. One more time. The process, good works. So we have the place before men, the process, good works. And a good work can be defined as something that makes somebody else's life a little bit easier. It can be defined as something that puts God's character on display, a good work. And it may be something um, incidental. It might be something monumental. But it's always being on the lookout for some way to serve somebody. A good work is somebody that helps to ease somebody's load, somebody that helps them along in their day. And we do that, of course, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may see your good works. The process is good works. It could be something as simple as opening a door, something as simple as, as uh, taking care of a bill, something as, as uh, simple as helping people with their groceries, something as simple as a, a good greeting, a nice greeting. Have a good day. You know, people say, hey, how are you doing? And we all, you know, we, we have various responses. You know somebody at some point is going to ask you how you're doing. It's just, it's going to happen. And, and so you have a response ready, you know. I remember I was standing somewhere and a guy said, how you doing? I said, better than I deserve. He said, yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> but it's true. By the grace of God, we're doing better than we deserve by the grace of God. And so uh, we let people know what our God is like by good works. The place before men, the process, good works. And then the final thing you have here is the purpose. And you see it at the end of verse 16, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The purpose, to glorify God. The purpose, to glorify God. Would you say that with me? The purpose, to glorify God. Again, the purpose, to glorify God. But let's uh, specify this a little bit. Because when I read that verse, I immediately was tempted to check out at that last part. Oh, yeah, I know I'm supposed to glorify God. I know that. Now, there are places in the Bible that teach us that, but that's not what this verse teaches us. It's not teaching us that we're to glorify God. Well, you look at the grammar of it. You look at the context of it. Here's how it reads. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That they who see my good works may glorify my Father which is in heaven. Well, what does that mean? To glorify God means to make much of God. If you want a simple definition, that's a good simple definition. To, to glorify God means to make much of God. Now, in other places, yes, the Bible tells us you and I, we are to glorify God. We're to put his character on display. We're to make much of God. But this verse isn't teaching that. This verse teaches that those who see our good works would make much of our God. Because in places where you work, it's like a family. Everybody's in everybody else's business. In the place where you go to school, in your neighborhood, it's often the same thing. Everybody knows everything about everybody. And when you, they know the struggles, when they know the struggles you've gone through and yet still see you have joy, they may glorify God and make much of him with comments like, man, your God must be amazing. I, other people that have gone through your circumstances, I've watched them crash and burn, but not you. You're still thriving. You're not surviving. You're thriving. Your God must be great. Your God must be generous. Your God still makes you cheerful. Your God still makes you joyful. A little while back, I was talking to some educators about this, this concept. What do we tell our students about God? Do we tell them, boy, he's really irritable till he gets his first cup of coffee in the morning? You know, don't, don't, uh, don't uh, uh, stir things up before that first cup of coffee. Or do we let them know our God is a wonderful God, a generous God, a gracious God, a marvelous God, a merciful God? When we are merciful, it reveals to people that our God is merciful. Now, there are times to be firm. Absolutely. There are times when the, the people must toe the line. Absolutely. We certainly understand that. But our God is a merciful God, and he is a gracious God. And as we are merciful, recognizing the server has had a hard day. When we are gracious, recognizing that other people are having struggles, when we are that way, it gives them the opportunity to know that our God is a gracious God. And when they comment, wow, you, you're, you're a different individual. You're not grouchy. You're not irritable all the time. What is that about? Well, it's just the way I was raised. It's my temperament. No, let's give God honor and glory. Well, I would be angry, and I would be irritable, and I would be temperamental. 
except for my God. I serve a wonderful God who has transformed my life, not just assured me of heaven after this life, but even in a very practical way has made me a different person. Well, I wasn't born that way. Well, I was born again. And as a result of that, I'm a different person. Born again. And so the plan that God has to make himself discoverable is that the places before men. The process is through our good works. And the purpose is that they would make much of our God. And sometimes it could be through something big. Sometimes it could be through something small. Like buying somebody a cup of coffee. Buying somebody a cup of coffee. Oh, I see there is a clock there. Okay, let's speed this up. (laughs) You may have read the story. A lady named Carol wrote it out. She talked about how that one day she was going to her favorite coffee store. And as she was driving through, she went to pay. And the clerk said, the barista said, oh, you don't have to pay today. She said, why not? She said, the customer ahead of you paid for you. She said, why would they do that? They were just paying it forward. And Carol remembered how good that felt, how how that just made her day that day. So she determined that each time she would go there, she would check in her rearview mirror to see if the person behind her was worthy of a free cup of coffee. (laughs) And one day she went to the barista window there and she looked in the rearview mirror and there was a lady in a red convertible. And this lady in the red convertible had flashy jewelry that was that was shining in the sunlight. And Carol thought to herself, I don't need to buy that lady a cup of coffee. She ought to buy me a cup of coffee. But there was that still small voice that was relentless. And when it came time to pay, she reluctantly said, and let me take care of the order of the person behind me as well. And suddenly there was that relief that comes from being obedient to God's promptings. Well, Carol had a couple of errands to run, so she pulled in a parking space not far from that drive-up place, and she went in, she ran her errands, and When she came back to her car, she noticed that right next to her car was the red convertible. And and standing beside the red convertible was the lady from the red convertible. Blonde hair, jewelry, and all that. And she said she was just dripping with money. And so Carol, as she went to her car to make her way to her car, this lady interrupted her and said, excuse me, I just wanted to thank you for buying me a cup of coffee this morning. And Carol said, glad to do it, with a twinge of guilt because she really wasn't all that glad to do that. But She said, glad to do it, just paying it forward. And the lady said, no, really, you do not understand what that cup of coffee meant to me this morning. Can I talk to you for a moment? So Carol put her things in the car, and and they had a conversation out there in the parking lot, not far from the coffee shop. The lady said to Carol, she said, my husband and I, we are in partnership with someone who has taken all of our money. We may have to file for bankruptcy. In addition to that, last month, our 30-year-old son, succumb to cancer and I was wondering this morning as I've wondered oftentimes does God really care about people like us does he really care and this morning he put it on the heart of a stranger to buy me a cup of coffee and it was as though God was reminding me he does care You have no idea what that cup of coffee meant to me this morning. Well, Carol and her husband had gone through some very similar circumstances, and they had an opportunity there in the parking lot to chat, and Carol was a great encouragement to this one who would now be her new friend. And she was able to talk to her about spiritual things and about the fact that God does care. Yeah, a simple cup of coffee in obedience to Matthew 5.16. Can little things mean a lot? (coughs) There's a guy named Joshua Rogers. And Joshua Rogers, back in September, wrote an article about an experience he had in the third grade. In the third grade, he had been in the principal's office six times. Six times. That does not speak well of what the future holds. And he says, I tried to behave, but there were just, I just had a hard time. And, and I would find myself in the principal's office. I, I, on the bus, there was a girl that I wanted to get her attention. So I pulled on her hair and I got her attention and also won a trip to the principal's office. I would try to be good, but it just wasn't inside of me. And it wasn't that his, he, it was that he respected his principal. It wasn't that his principal, because he was able to use um, corporal punishment at that time on this little third grader. And, uh, and I want to make sure I said corporal, not capital, because sometimes I get confused and misspeak. <laughs> 
capital punishment is different for a third grader. Uh, but but uh, he was, and it wasn't that Mr. Kincaid, and he named the guy in the article, it wasn't that Mr. Kincaid spanked very hard. It's just that I knew I had disappointed this man that I respected so much. But one day in the third grade, he says, I was sitting in the classroom and the teacher called my name, Joshua. And I looked up, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, the principal wants to see you. And he thought, what did I do now? I'm just doing math. What did I do now? So he goes to the principal's office, sits in the chair in the secretary's office till the principal calls him in. And finally, Mr. Kincaid calls Josh in. Josh has a seat there. And the principal says, Joshua. And Joshua says, yes, sir. And the principal says, I hear you are doing very well in your class. And I just called you up here to let you know how very proud of you I am. And Joshua said, me, sir? <laughs> yes, you. In addition to that, he had on his, he had on his desk a, a jar of peppermint candies. And he said, and I wanted to give you a peppermint candy to let you know how proud I am of you. And so Joshua held out his hand and the principal put a peppermint candy there. He said, I held on to that like it was a gold coin. And I went back to the class and, you know, people are asking, what you do? Did you get in trouble? Your eyes aren't red. You weren't crying. What's the matter? What's going on? And he could say, Mr. Kincaid called me to his office to tell me how proud of me he is. And he gave me a peppermint. He said that was the last time he ever visited the principal's office for anything that was done wrong. That was the last time he visited the principal's office. Can a little thing change a boy's life? Can a peppermint candy change a boy's life? Indeed it can. Small things, letting God's light shine through us, making God discoverable. In that moment, in that moment, Mr. Kincaid was demonstrating that God is gracious and that God is forgiving. And God is the God of fresh starts. He's the God of, of new beginnings. He's a gracious God. And Joshua, many times through the forum that he has, has had the opportunity to talk about how Christ has saved him and made him into the man, the husband and the dad that he is. Yes, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The place before men. The process, good works, making somebody else's life a little easier. And the purpose is that they might make, make much of our God. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word.